and then he plays them in the car to his wife. <laughs> anyway, good afternoon, everybody, and um, it, it's great to be here. We've done quite a few of these things, and uh, I have to say this is the biggest crowd we've had so far. So, um, anyway, uh, uh, it is a very special year, uh, the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500, and I assume that some of you are ticket holders. Uh, it is it's getting quite a lot of interest, and uh, I didn't start thinking about how totally unique it was until just a few weeks ago, and I started thinking that there's events, there were motor racing events that, that were held before the first 500, like for instance, the French Grand Prix was first held in 1906, five years before the first Indianapolis 500, but because of the fact that uh, Europe was down for so many years uh, in, in and around World War I and following it, that by the early 1920s, the Indianapolis 500 had already been held more times than the French Grand Prix then. So uh, thinking about some of the other events, long running events around the world, I don't think there's ever been another automobile race that's been held 100 times. And it uh, started in 1911, third year of the track. Uh, some people think that the, the, the track opened in 1911 and that actually happened in 1909. And then uh, in the third season, uh, when they were still figuring out what they were gonna do and, and somebody hit upon the idea of having a 500 mile race and that was a huge success. They've done that every year since, except for down uh, in two years during World War I, 17 and 18, and then 42 through 45. So um, in 2011, that was the 100th anniversary of the first 500, and now we're having the 100th 500. And uh, so, uh, as probably most of you in the room uh, know, when we go a little further afield, we, we need to do a little bit of more 101, but uh, Greenfield, I don't think we need to do that. Uh, but just the, the, the track itself is totally unique because it was built in 1909, and it's the one only original Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And uh, the two and a half miles that went down in uh, uh, the, the, the spring and, and summer of 1909, uh, the first surface was a disaster, crushed rock and tar, and so they quickly realized that they needed to address that. So in the fall of 1909, down went 3,200,000 paving, street paving bricks, and that's where it got the nickname, the Brickyard. And so people have said, uh, well, what ever happened to all those bricks? Well. Most of the way around, they're still there today. Uh, there are bricks that have uh, come into private collections, and uh, the Culver Block from Petersburg is the, is the most common one, and that's when there was a couple of um, uh, jobs that were done, and rather than go into all of that now, uh, the main one being that whenever they put in a tunnel, there's now six tunnels that have gone in since the track opened. And every time they put a tunnel in, a chunk of racetrack comes out, and then when they replace it, uh, they don't put the bricks back in. In fact, probably within the memory of some of you, maybe that when the uh, the, the, uh, the main tunnel, uh, the four lane that goes under the track between turns one and two off of 16th Street, that went in uh, the summer of 1972-73, and uh, it was a little weird to drive down 16th Street for a while because the racetrack stopped and started again. So anyway, when they put it back in, they, they did not put uh, all of the early surfaces. But uh, other than the fact that the, the track goes over a creek, or crick, as the uh, lovers <laughs> call it, uh, which you, you used to be able to see until it got covered over in 2008, boo. Uh, the creek would uh, it go, it still goes underneath uh, uh, the, uh, the main straightaway um, under, under Georgetown Road and then under the track just before the entrance to turn one and then it got rerouted but it still goes across at an angle 
and then out underneath 16th Street. So, uh, lengthy uh, explanation there, but when you're taking the bus ride around today, I tell people if you get on the tour bus and do a lap of the track, uh, it's exactly the same two and a half miles that uh, Ray Haroon and, and Barney Oldfield were driving, uh, except that you're about three feet further above sea level than they were, because they kept piling all these surfaces on, uh, except for the last two, which they graded off of what, before they put the next one down. Anyway, um, I have a little fun with this, and, and uh, uh, so we've already d discussed this. Well, where in England are you from? Well, I'm from the south of England, uh, a town called Salisbury in Wiltshire, and uh, it's just a few miles from Stonehenge, and it's a very historical cathedral town. Well, everywhere in England is a historical <laughs> cathedral town, but anyway, Salisbury Cathedral was built in 1220, and that's the new cathedral to replace the one that was up on the on uh, the top of the uh, the castle rings before that. And then also uh, there's an there's an area called um, in which the uh, the cathedral sits called the close, and there's a wall. A, a high wall that goes around this uh, this uh, sort of like separated neighborhood and I actually went to school on the cathedral grounds uh, the equivalent of high school I went to, to grammar school and I didn't pay attention to what was going on I was I wanted to go to Indianapolis I didn't care about you know that the handled the uh, you know stayed as somebody's guest in the house and the close and all this kind of stuff so I did not know until I went back with my kids when they got out of junior high, I learned that the wall that makes the close was from the original cathedral. They simply dismantled it and put up a new wall. And so then also there's a, a market that runs every Tuesday and Saturday uh, uh, by royal degree. And, and uh, they used to have, they, they moved the livestock to another area, but they have fresh fruit and meat and, and uh, you know, various uh, flea market type stuff that people sell every Tuesday and Saturday. And so I've, I've had a lot of fun saying that, that um, whenever the Yanks came over uh, with all their money to, 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 uh, to, for the summer holidays, and I said, well, this is cute. How long has this been going on? Oh, about 800 years. <laughs> so anyway, the point is that for me, that makes the Indianapolis Speedway uh, so unique. And, and uh, when I moved to the area, I remember when Riverfront Stadium was new. And I think that had a life of about 20 years and then they built another one and knocked the old one down or something. So anyway, uh, the one and only original Indianapolis Speedway and they keep adding to it. Um, the Greenfield Connection, uh, I remember Coming through here, you know, you had to go. And I was just telling about Mayor Harmless uh, when I was viewing the area and, and uh, I was working for the United States Auto Club. And whenever we went to Trenton or Langhorn or Points East, I remember that uh, uh, when I was first making those trips as a passenger, because I wasn't driving yet, you had to go 40 all the way to Richmond. Stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And then I think when you got to the other side of Richmond, you got up and you got onto 70, and I think you went for like, there was like maybe 20 miles or something, and then you had to get off uh, by Dayton. And then over a period of the next few years, about every time you make a trip, there was a little bit more of a section done. But uh, Greenfield is one of the towns where, and people have told me as they have a lot with Richmond, they said, you know, when, when uh, it used to be a big deal, race day, because if we didn't go to the race, we'd listen to it on the radio. And when the race was ended, then we would get our you know, chairs and, and, and uh, lawn furniture and stuff, and we would move down to, uh, to Main Street and set up, and we'd watch all the cars coming back, going back to Pennsylvania and New York and so on and so forth. We'd wave at the people and try to write down how many license plates that we could. Uh, the main Greenfield connection, I guess, would be that Mark Dismore was from here, and uh, the, the uh, Comet Cart Sales that uh, that uh, was his dad, and then you know Mark when he got a little bit older. Um, in uh, 1996, uh, in the Indianapolis 500, uh, John Menard's team 
Mark Dismore and Tony Stewart were teammates. And uh, that was by coincidence, but very nostalgic for the two of them, because Tony Stewart, when he was a little boy, he and his, he and his dad used to go to Dismore's to buy their go-karts when Tony was like, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, I don't know if this one will compute with anybody, but there was a driver from Greenfield who tried to qualify for the 500 in 1948, and I think his name was pronounced Bob Drager, and it was D-R-O-E-G-E-R, -E -E and uh, he was there in 1948, and he drove a car called the Baldwin Special, which had a Duesenberg engine, this, and way after Duesenbergs weren't around anymore. So um, it was uh, what in racing vernacular, the polite version would be unsanitary race car. And uh, if you're into racing, you can probably figure out what I really had going on in my mind. But anyway, so anyway, uh, he took part of his rookie test of it. And I remember looking through the phone book one day uh, in the, in the 60s or 70s, and I saw the name Bob Drager from Greenfield, and I thought, golly, that guy's still there, I should call him. Well, it turns out that must have been a relative, I don't know if he had a son by the same name, because the Bob Drager that took part of the rookie test went down in a private plane crash in August of 1950. So anyway, I'll just throw that one out. If anybody has any knowledge of him, um, that's my goal in life, I want to know what I didn't know. So anyway, uh, the greater part of what we're going to do here, I think, is uh, is uh, since you are from the area and you either already know or you don't care, uh, I think let's just, we'll, we'll do a, a sort of a, a, an informal Q&A here for a little bit. Oh yeah, we got plenty of time. Okay, uh, do, do a Q&A and uh, I'll try and answer any questions that you may have and um, the, the disclaimers, I do not have a technical knowledge. Uh, I, uh, I'm not into controversy, try to avoid that wherever possible. And uh, I'm about the people, and uh, I just like telling the anecdotes. So uh, kind of, uh, I have to say that, that sometimes some of the opinions expressed herein are not necessarily those of the management. <laughs> uh, by golly, this, this promo that we're just running, it's, it's, it's move forward and you gotta look ahead and everything. Hey, I live happily in the past. And, uh, and, and I get paid for it. And uh, so I made a career out of it. People said, Don, you, 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 you don't, can't keep living in the past. Yes, you can. So uh, it's about the people. So preferably, uh, if you wanna talk about Jimmy Bryan or Sam Hanks or Tom Carnegie or Sid Collins or mom answer or, or anything like that, uh, I'll, I'll entertain anything you've got. So uh, raise your hand and uh, yell out. Yes, sir. Uh, John, uh, what brought you to Indianapolis? An airplane and a Greyhound bus. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but my, my interest in the race, which uh, uh, formed, uh, I, I was uh, being born and raised in England where automobile racing, motor racing, is a very popular sport. And uh, so I was always, it's very popular, and England's not very big, so uh, growing up, you know, you couldn't help but not know who the people were. Just like if you lived in Indianapolis, I mean, you know, if you, you, you'd hear the name Bill Vukovich whether you cared about it or not, and no buys and so on and so forth. So. Anyway, I knew who the, the, uh, the main drivers were, and, uh, but I, it, it wasn't particularly, you know, it, it, it didn't grab me until I was about 12 years old. And then I got very interested in it, and the history, and stats, and, and I started memorizing stuff. And I was not a very good student, and uh, I, but anything that interested me, I would devour it. And uh, so I have learned in recent years, uh, uh, two or three times, uh, people have come up after when I've done a talk and, and uh, we played Q&A a little bit, done some trivia. I've had several people tell me what you have 
is a selective, retentive, easy access memory. <laughs> and uh, I've been get, given credit of having a photographic memory, which I do not have. I've talked to some people that have a photographic memory, and, and you, you, you soak it all up. And then you have to train yourself to not learn and, and, and try and shut out what isn't important. Well, I, I didn't have that, but I, um, so I, 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 I in, uh, in reading about the history of the 500, and um, early, quite early on, uh, this made no sense at all. But uh, the, there was no the, there was no world championship for drivers until 1950. It was a Grand Prix thing, and uh, so why it had never been done before, I don't know. But finally, 1950 was the first world championship for drivers. And so Formula One was a new name at that time, but they were still trying to, you know, making it up as they went along. And uh, the American delegates in, in the European meeting said, well, there, we, we don't have a Grand Prix of the United States, but uh, surely the Indianapolis 500, which is our big race, that should count. And they agreed. And it wasn't about specifications, it was about drivers earning points. And so, um, each year, you know, there would be these different bunch of names would appear in the column of their Indianapolis. And so, you know, I knew who Fangio was and Sterling Moss and Peter Collins and Mike Hawthorne, but, you know, who's Sam Hanks and, and Bob Swikert and, and Mike Nazarek, you know? So, um, anyway, that's how I first learned about it. I, I mentioned it to my dad and he knew what the Indianapolis 500 was, but a lot of people did not. And uh, so there was something about those names, I suppose, that um, made me want to know more. And then uh, at some point I was reading a magazine called Motorsport, and there was a review for the Indianapolis 500 yearbook. And I thought, golly, a whole book devoted to a year. So um, I got that, uh, I was, my parents got that for a present, and uh, when I started flipping through the pages of that, it opened up a whole new world, and I thought, I gotta go. So that's sort of kind of a longer version uh, than, than you wanted, but um, uh, I just showed up and, and uh, just magically uh, started meeting all the people that I had read about, and uh, um, Mary Harmless is probably sick and tired of hearing by now, um, probably the, th the thing that surprised me the most when I finally made it in 1964 was how friendly the drivers were, and I was really amazed by that. So, you know, everything that you hear about Hoosier hospitality, I got it tenfold. And uh, I just thought all of the drivers would, would, that you would just get a fleeting glance of them, you know, and that they would have handlers and, and that, you know, you, you might see one off in the distance. I never expected that I would get to meet so many of them so freely and that they would be such really nice people. And, and that has been a constant over the years that virtually all of the racing drivers that I've ever met, whether they were NASCAR or even some, a lot of the Formula One guys, some have got an edge, but some of them were really nice people. And uh, But the people driving at the Indianapolis 500, I thought they'd be really tough nuts and, and you know, intense and uh, lovely. Immediately started, you know, introduced me to their families and uh, so some of those friendships have continued on and, um, you know, just being blessed with, uh, after, after the 64 visit, I came back in 65, Sid Collins, uh, I owe so much to, I mean, he took me under his wing and then a, a man named Henry Banks of the United States Auto Club and he hired me and I went to work for USAC right after the 65 race. I, I mean, I came over on a one-way ticket and a green card. I didn't have any office at all. I was just flying blind, but it was the thing to do. And um, so I've just been blessed ever since, and we do the radio call-in show, and and, uh, and I talk to groups, and people care, and that's great, because I've been doing it anyway. It's only been listening, and the fact that they do makes it better. All right. Yes, sir. Um, what would you say as far as drivers go for the 500? 
what's the farthest away or most obscure place that a driver has come from? The most obscure place? that Boy, I've never had that one before. <laughs> um, well, golly, I mean, you know, Australia and New Zealand, if you're talking geographically, uh, if you mean the oddest places, um, golly, that's a very good question. I'd have to think about that, because there's been some that have come from, you know, pretty far afield. Um, I don't know how to answer that one, because, I mean, that would be right, but then, I mean, if, if you if you drill a hole, we come out in Australia, I think, don't we? So, <laughs> but um, I'm just trying to think some of the unique. I mean, so many uh, small countries have been represented. Um, probably in recent years, Mikhail Lucian from Russia, I suppose. Um, whoever thought there would be a Russian race driver? So I'd have, probably have to think about that. Terrible answer, sorry. No, I've never had that one before. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wonder if you could tell us about Ray Haroon. Oh, Ray Haroon? Like, you know, when you compare him, like Babe Ruth, everybody, you know? Yeah. And it's like, Ray Haroon really didn't become famous till later. Or is that just my That is correct, yeah. Yes, he, he suggests that Ray Haroon became famous later. Um, Ray Haroon, I was fortunate enough to meet and spend some time with winner of the 1911 500. And uh, he lived in a, in a trailer court on the south side of Anderson, if you're familiar with where the little racetrack is. And it's just, uh, golly, for probably less than a mile from the, from the uh, what was the Sun Valley Speedway, and now I think it's just called Anderson Speedway. Anyway, he lived as a, as a very elderly gentleman in, uh, in that trailer court, so I would go to see him from time to time. And, uh, the, uh, he, he talked about the, you know, we have talked about the mirror, and uh, when uh, he told me the story of where that came from and where he first saw it, he said, he said, I got uh, credit for inventing the rear view mirror. He said, well, of course I didn't. He said, I, I've seen it done on a horse-drawn vehicle in Chicago in 1904. <laughs> and uh, he said, I, I was, uh, he said, I was a chauffeur for William Fawn, who was the president of Montgomery Ward, and he said, uh, he said, when I got the job as his chauffeur, I didn't know how to drive, but he said it was just tiller steering, 1904. So anyway, he said, I was outside a building one day, he was inside taking a meeting, and there's all this commotion going on in the street, and uh, you know, no traffic pattern at all, and bicycles, and animals, and stuff going on, and he said, that um, at some point a horse-drawn taxi came by and, uh, and he said, fellow sitting up on the top with the, with the cloak and the top hat and a whip and it's going like this and he said as he went by I noticed it was a pole sticking out with a mirror and he, and he would keep looking in the mirror to make sure that he wasn't, you know, running over a, a an, an animal or not get somebody off their bicycle. He thought, oh, that's a great idea. I'll have to remember that. So when the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the questions were raised by the officials in practice for the 1911 500, and, 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 and Marmon was a local company. It was down at uh, uh, Kentucky and Morris in Indianapolis building automobiles, and they built this special racing car with a single seat. And so when the people complained uh, that, that he didn't have the second person with him, the riding mechanic, to point out that somebody was coming up one side or the other, and uh, so he said, I remember that, that um, fellow on the, on the, with the horse drawn taxi. So they put up this mirror, which is there today, you can see it in the museum, the four rods, and then there's this little casing, which produces downforce, by the way, it's wedge-shaped, and it's got a mirror that's three inches by eight across. And uh, so I, so he could drive along, the theory being, drive along and then look up and, and see what was going on behind him. And so I said, so did it work out pretty well? He said, to tell you the truth, it, it shook so bad on the bricks, I couldn't see a damn thing. <laughs> so anyway, um, 
I, another thing that he said was of interest was he said when I was first driving, he said it was all about the automobiles. We, the, the idea was to sell automobiles to the public. And he said, so in 1911, he said, I didn't win the 500, Marmon won the 500. I just happened to be the hired hand that was driving the car. <laughs> and, he, and he said, really, he said it wasn't until years later, he said it was really like in the early 1950s, he said that I started to get notoriety and people wanted me to come and give talks and everything like that. And he said, I was almost too old to take advantage of it. But he said in the early days, the driver, that wasn't the focus, it was the automobile company. Um, final breaker room note, um, he passed away uh, on uh, January 19th of 1968. And he was just had his 89th birthday one week before. And uh, I went up for the funeral with Henry Banks and uh, a fellow named Frankie Bain, who was the, the, the registrar, and Harry Hartz, one of the great names of the, of the early days. Um, he was the 1926 national champion, a wizard on the board tracks, and he's the only person to this day that finished second in the Indianapolis 500 three times and never won. There's been other three-time runners up, but they also had a victory to go with it. But he did that, became a two-time winning car owner and then a prominent official. So I'm driving up to and, and back from uh, the Ray Haroon uh, burial in January with, with uh, two national champions and a, and a prominent official, and I'm the kid sort of like this. So I got to know Harry Hartz pretty well, and I knew that he was very good friends with Ray Haroon, not making this up. And so um, the, 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 uh, the wife uh, was considerably younger than him, and then it came to light later on that it wasn't exactly a wife. But anyway, uh, so, but anyway, so she, a real sweet lady, but kind of like a, a, an Edith Bunker type, and flushed all over it. And so we're driving back and uh, talking about her, and, and I said to, um, to Harry Hartz, I said, uh, I always got the impression that he was a ladies man, and Harry said, oh yeah. And I said, well, he was married several times, and Harry said, yeah. And I said, do you have any idea, because I'm hearing all these rumors, do you know how many times Ray Haroon was married? And he said, and I'm not making this up, he said, I have no idea, Donald, but he said, I was his best man three times. <laughs> so, true story. But um, anyway, I, I, on um, May the 1st, there's a marker being uh, uh, um, unveiled, uh, like a historic marker, up in Anderson uh, to commemorate Ray Haroon and, and the fact that he lived there. And uh, so I have to say a few remarks, and I don't know if I'm going to do that last one or not. But, uh, <laughs> all right, questions and answers. Oh, all the way in the back, yes. Okay, the first foreigner to win the 500 was Jules Gou, a Frenchman in 1913. And uh, actually, uh, the, the, the foreign drivers had been courted from the very beginning. I mean, they wanted the, this, this influx of, of foreign drivers now is nothing new. They actually wanted them uh, when, the, when, the, when the place first opened. And so, if you look at 1911 and 1912 lineups, there's several foreign cars and several foreign drivers, but the foreign cars had been imported and were owned by Americans, and the foreign drivers, there were quite a number, I, I can't tell you now, but there was probably seven or eight people at least in the 1911 500 who were foreign born and were residents and, and hadn't taken citizenship yet. But 1913 um, was the first year that the Europeans decided to come over and, and run in the race. And, uh, and several, there was about seven or eight came. And uh, 
that that's the first year where they just came for the purpose of, of running in the race and then going back. And I really admire those early people when you think about what they had to go through to get to the track. Because there's no fax machines, and I don't know about phones, but you know, how would you, uh, how would the teams in, in France and, and Italy know what to build, that the specs would be correct? And uh, then, but, and, but, but they, they had people that they could talk to over there that were like representatives. But then they would have to then take cars to La Harbor and put them on a boat and then sail to New York, and then they're still not to Indianapolis yet, and, and so they would come by rail. So real ordeal just to get here, and then uh, when the race was over, turn around and go back. And then I think that, that um, and, and kind of sort of touching on uh, uh, what I said about how friendly everybody was here, I know that the Europeans uh, were very suspicious of the Americans when they showed up. The Americans were curious as to what they had, but they wanted to help. And uh, they didn't quite understand that at first because in Europe, it was a little bit of a different attitude and, and uh, they thought you know, that the Yanks were coming in and trying to steal all their secrets. And uh, so once that ice was broken, then uh, you know, they had a great time. And in fact, um, Carl Fisher, uh, when realized that none of the people on the team, on the Peugeot team, uh, spoke English very well. And so he had an American, uh, a, 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 a former driver, who spoke some French, and he put him on the team to be their uh, pit manager. And uh, so anyway, 1913 is the answer to your question. And then there's been quite a few since. I, in fact, I think, I, I was I was playing around with something in the, in the last couple of days, and I, I think the Indianapolis 500 has now been it's been run 99 times. I think there's 28 of them have been won by somebody who was not born in the United States. So that's everywhere from you know visitors like Jim Clark and Graham Hill to Mario Andretti who was born in Italy and then and then. Uh, came to the United States as a, as a 15 year old. And then of course recently we've had uh, uh, Dan Weldon and uh, you know Tony Canaan and Castro Nevers and Dario Franchitti who's a Scot. Is that, is that amazing or not? When you hear the name Dario Franchitti and then you look at him and then, his, and then he starts talking, you think, whoa, that's not what I was expecting the accent. <laughs> but uh, it's amazing. These are Scottish as Scottish could be. All right. Yes, sir. All the way in the back. Uh, out of all the drivers that have entered the race and have made the field of 33 uh, the most times, which driver has not ever won the race but has made the field of 33? Okay, the, the greatest number of starts by a driver who never won is, is uh, 22 by George Snyder. And uh, then I'm not even sure who would, would yes. How many times did Lloyd Ruby in? Uh, Lloyd Ruby was 18. <laughs> and then Michael Andretti was creeping up there. I think, in fact, Michael Andretti, I'd have to count on my fingers, I think he ended up with 19 starts. But, um, yeah, Lloyd Ruby. That, uh, Ruby, um, wh what a great guy he was, and very highly regarded by the other drivers. I mean, in, in addition to being a fan favorite, when I've, I've talked to drivers privately, and it comes up about who they think is the best, and there's real some some surprises on on some of their uh, some of their opinions. But uh, nobody, well, Johnny Boyd said that he thought that Lloyd Ruby adapted to the Indianapolis Speedway better than any driver that he ran against. But as when, when, there's, when the drivers are talking about the greats that they ran against, Parnelli Jones probably gets more first place votes than anybody. But Lloyd Ruby is usually mentioned, and he was highly regarded by the, by the Europeans. Jackie Stewart was very high on Lloyd Ruby. Did AJ, yes. did AJ Floyd ever help Lloyd at all with all this? Like he always went out of the race. Um, did Foyt ever help Ruby? I don't think so. Again, fellow Texans, but you know, Ruby never drove for him. 
Um, so, I mean, they were friends, but uh, um, no, I mean, that was ever, was there a time when, when Ruby was having a problem like on the last day and then Foyt came to his aid? No, that never happened because normally Ruby would have qualified on the first or second day. And that there's other people that Foyt has helped out that, that were not on his team. But uh, no, not Ruby. Uh, they shared a current one. So the, the year that uh, A.J. Foyt and Dan Gurney won the 24 Hours of Le Mans for Ford, uh, at Sebring in uh, March, Ruby and Foyt were paired to finish second in the, in the 12 Hours of Sebring. Back in the days when all of the great drivers were running all of the all of the major events, we we missed that the kind of the interchange of driver. Sure. Uh, when Mr. Holman purchased the Motor Speedway, yes. About how much do you recall that he paid for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the second part? What was his interest in racing? He was a successful businessman in Terre Haute. So what prompted him to buy it, and how that all come about? All right, the question was about uh, Tony Holman. How much did he pay for the Indianapolis Speedway? And, and then basically, why did he buy it? Um, it? It was brought to his attention that it was for sale by Wilbur Shaw. And uh, it, it was in its second ownership uh, under the stewardship of Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, who was a driver in the 500 before he ever knew how to fly a plane. and, and uh, went off and, and became the World War I flying ace. And uh, so, uh, cut a few details out and just say Rickenbacker was the owner from, of title from 27 to 45. And the place shut down during World War II uh, because the government put a, a ban on all, you know, using up fuel and tires and so on and so forth. So there was no racing. And uh, Firestone was developing a synthetic rubber tire that they were going to introduce to the on passenger cars after the war, and Wilbur Shaw, who was by that time the most iconic Indianapolis 500 driver, he won three times, and had been runner-up three times, and also had at least two others get away from him, and uh, now he was working in Akron for Firestone Aircraft Division, and. Um, so uh, they asked, Firestone asked him to, to do the test. So he came down and saw the track was in just in dreadful condition. It was like a jungle because nothing had happened for four years and the weed there, the golf course was still operating, but the rest of it had been allowed to just grow and grow and grow. So uh, Wilbur Shaw was quite wealthy by that time and his original intent was that he would try to purchase the track and have partners, but he would be the principal owner. And uh, so, uh, in, in fact, I, I think he thought that if he could get, and you, and you, you, uh, you, uh, you mathematicians here will be able to get, my, see if my math is correct. I think if, if he could get 20 people to put up $25,000 a piece, that would be 500,000, I think and that he felt that he could put the balance in because about $750,000 was the asking price. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, yeah, the, the partnership thing didn't work out and so, you know, back to square one. And then one day he was talking with a fellow named Homer Cochran, who was a real estate broker and a friend of Wilbur's for years because he tried to drive dirt track when he was a young guy. So he'd run against Wilbur Shaw before Shaw ever drove in the 500 and then realized at some point, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not gonna be a race driver. And so uh, then he went into business, but they kept in contact. So when uh, uh, Wilbur was telling him about the latest trials and tribulations, then Homer Cochran said, there's a fellow over in Terre Haute I think you would be interested in meeting. His name is Tony Holman. So he owns Clapper Girl Baking Powder and, and Holman and Company. So they went over there and uh, delighted to find that, that Tony Holman was a big race fan and that uh, he had, um, oh, on the business uh, thing, um, well, I, 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 
concerned that we've gone past one o'clock here and I'm still talking, but I'm, I'm seeing a, a lot of transfixed expressions with that. <laughs> I love that. So uh, if, if you're, you're inspiring me to want to, to tell you more, and I'm trying to think, I've got to cut some of the details out here. But um, so anyway, Tony Holman had uh, certainly knew who Wilbur Shaw was, and his father had taken him to the race when he was 13. He went to the 1914 race when he was 13. And I think, it seems to me that there was a whole group of gone, and they were all older men, and he was sort of like the young kid that went, but it was like a rite of passage. And evidently it was very important to him because he would always talk about the halfway house, which was some place, I don't know if that was Brazil or somewhere, but there was a joint that they had stayed. And uh, even even uh, in, in the final years of his life, that the freeway was in, whenever they would come back to uh, from Terre Haute and do business at the track, when they went to go home, somebody told me he would almost say, he would almost always say, let's take the old national road back. He liked to go back 40 and then see all these joints, because evidently there was this very special memory of, gone to, of having gone to the track when he was a kid. So um, anyway, there, there, there was a bunch of negotiations, and, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, this, this is being recorded, and that makes me a little bit, in fact, it's being videotaped as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I made some, uh, some derogatory comments when we were going one over in, uh, in Frankfurt the other day, which uh, hopefully will end up on the cutting floor. Um, otherwise, I may be coming to the Greenfield Chamber of Commerce looking for a job. <laughs> anyway, so uh, there, there's, it has never been publicly announced how the sale was made, and I'm sure that Ice Miller have it in, in the boxes and everything like that, so someday we can find out. But anyway, my favorite story about how the money was raised, and there's several different ones, uh, Joe Clotier was... Um, the money man. He was the bean counter for Tony Holman. They were both about the same age, and in fact, Joe Clotier became the president of the track after Tony Holman had passed away. Well, anyway, um, he was a, a, a really cagey guy. In fact, one of the reasons that Homer Cochran knew about Clotier and Holman was he said, what they've been doing is uh, they, they will take a business that's, that's uh, fallen on hard times but has potential, and so they purchase it and then build it back up and then sell it. So anyway, the, the, the story is, and I say this uh, guardedly because it, it's just a, one of the versions I was told, that Joe Cloutier was sitting in all these meetings with Rickenbacker's representatives, and that they've still established the price of $750,000. So supposedly, supposedly he excused himself and went and made a phone call and he called a guy named Joe Jacobs who had a company called uh, Sports Services. And he said, if we were to purchase the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, would you be interested in an exclusive on concessions? And uh, so Joe Jacobs said, yeah, what are you proposing? So Clotier apparently said, how about $50,000 for 15 years? And Joe Jacobs said, I'll take it. And if you figure that out, he went back with the, with the track paid for with one phone call. I, I don't know if that's, that's one of those stories. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I hate one day to find out that it's not true. But, but uh, anyway, so Tony was, um, uh, and another thing about him was, apparently he had great, um, vision in, in, you know, into the future. Uh, somebody told me Howard Hughes was like that. I knew a guy that worked for Howard Hughes, and he said he had the ability to just see through everything and look into the future. And so when Tony Holman came over to look at the track, and it was just in terrible condition, he could see through that and, and think that, that maybe it, it could work, and uh, none of his friends thought so. But And then in, in six months, they, they turned it around, and. Um, not the place running. A couple of notes on, on Tony Holman because I was playing around with some stuff the other day and points that probably people didn't really know about him. He was an amazing man, very shy, 
uh, ill at ease, giving uh, talks and everything, but he was a very generous man and a very caring man and uh, was very in, was concerned about the spectators <coughs> at the track. And uh, many of the things, some of the things that are in, in place today, like for instance, they used to fire the cars up in the garage area and drive them out on the track for practice like NASCAR does today. And in 1957, Tony Holman made a change so that the cars would have to be pushed out to and from or, or towed with the track or whatever through Gasoline Alley so that the fans could stand there and see the cars up close. And, um, and he, was, he was quite the business man in a, in a very uh, you know, modest and, and uh, way. And uh, he was an athlete. Uh, he went to Yale. Uh, in, in, and before he went to Yale, in 1919, uh, the, uh, the Amateur Athletic Association of the United States voted him as the best high school pole vaulter in the country. And then uh, in 1923, Yale went undefeated in its football season, 8-0. Eight, eight and uh, Tony Holman was on the squad. And uh, he took part in several uh, uh, track and field meets one was at Wembley Stadium in England, and he won the, the hurdles event. Prior to all of that, and this one, I, it, it, I have some time yet, I have a little, uh, to, trying to get around this one. When he was 17 years old, he went to, to uh, France during World War I and drove an ambulance for the Red Cross in the, in the, the, uh, the closing stages of World War I, and he was 17. Anyway, um, I'll bet you're sorry you asked that question. <laughs> you know, I, I'll tell you what, um, thank you, they're, they're, they're all, we're almost the entire group is still here, and you thought, how do we get out of this place? <laughs> I, I, I love doing stories, uh, and I love audiences like this. I, I used to go around and give a lot of talks. I've spoken in in, uh, in Greenfield many times, uh, but years ago for all these little service organizations and everything, um, we, we probably should, oh, we gotta do, we gotta do the pitch, right? Oh, sure. We gotta do the, we'll do the pitch. Uh, when we're done here, which will be very shortly, um, I, uh, we're not in a hurry to leave, and we'll, uh, I'd be happy to carry on, on on a more informal basis, but yeah, almost forgot. Um, is there anybody here who has been a yellow shirt ever? None. Just, okay, I'm surprised. I thought there might be some. All right, would any of you consider being a yellow shirt? And this is perfectly serious. Because they're expecting a much larger crowd this year, they need people. And they have a lot of renewals, so they've got the same group, you know, pretty much every year, but they need more. And so if you would have any interest in being a yellow shirt, uh, it, it, some of them have had a bad rap, and I, I think that's unfair. They're really good people that are just sort of trying to make sure that the guests have a good time and, and that everybody gets to where they need to be. They're very, very helpful, they're, and they're all enthusiastic, and some people have been doing it for years. So, if you would want to do that, or you know anybody that would, we've had husbands and wives do it. Uh, we did this one function, um, Golly, I forget where we were. Where, 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 was it? Plymouth. Was it Plymouth? Uh, we were up in Plymouth, and when the thing was over, uh, the, 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 the waitress was busting the tables, and she came over and she said, I think my parents would like to do that. Could I have one of those applications, please? <laughs> anyway, Mayor Harmless has the applications. Uh, it's not for the whole month. You could just tell them the days that you were available. It pays eight bucks an hour. And uh, and then uh, and then uh, also you know we we can't guarantee that you get pits or garage area you know you might get infield or, or turn four or something but it's it's a lot of fun and uh, you can just have access and, and uh, be involved somehow so seriously if you have any thought that you might want to do that or we have a, a friend or relative that might want to do it Mayor Thomas has the applications. Um, at that point, we probably should, uh, since we ran over a couple of minutes, 
It's never happened before, right? <laughs> never happened. And, um, oh, we, by the way, we will be doing Talk of Gasly and Alley on 1070 again, and uh, things, the, the world keeps changing. In fact, it's not even WIBC anymore, but it's still 1070, and we're still going. So that'll be every night in May, and uh, after we're done here, we'll be happy to stick around and, you know, come and share your stories. But thank you very much, everybody. Well, as a lifelong fan of the Indy 500, I'm sure I could stay all day, but I know others need to get back to work. So another round of applause for Donald Davidson. Thank you so much for sharing.